I often forget how old I am. I sometimes have to type in my date of birth into Google to remember if I'm 38 or 37, which Google told me a half an hour ago, I'm 37 turning 38. When I was 26, I had a whole entire year where I thought I was a different age to what I was. I how thought hard I- did you party that year? <laughs> <laughs> Hi guys and welcome back to another episode of Life Uncut. I'm Laura and I'm producer Keisha filling in for Brit because she has entered the jungle. And last night, Keish and Mitch Churi came over to my house and we sat there and we all sat there like nervous parents watching Brit enter into the jungle. Also took their sweet ass time. I was like, is she even on this episode? I started to feel as though we were going to have to come back tonight and watch Brit actually into the jungle. But they did eventually get there. And I was actually really impressed with the cast. I know every year everyone's like, who the fuck is that? And usually sometimes I'm fair. Sometimes I'm like, I have no clue who that person is. But it's usually because, you know, I'm an NRL girl. It will be because they're an AFL person. You know, it would be because they're not in my niche categories. I, I like that you use that example, but that's exactly what played out on last night's episode. The only person that we were all like, who the fuck is that? Was some guy who was, you know, an ex AFL player. And Everyone then, from Victoria, South Australia, Western Australia right now are screaming. <laughs> sorry, like, uh, so sorry. <laughs> it should come as no surprise after five years, but I'm not. Football doesn't, it doesn't get my juices going. It's not for me, it especially abs- not the AFL. I don't understand it. It's just got the long poles and people in small shorts. The end. Which I'm, is nice. People are unsubscribing. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Which, which is nice. I'm not turning away from that. <laughs> well, anyway, okay, so. The thing I don't understand and will never understand about I'm a Celebrity is why people don't lie. And what I'm saying is, okay, so Brit is petrified of heights. It's probably the one thing that she deeply, deeply cannot do and doesn't ever want to put herself in that situation. She has no interest in skydiving. She has no interest in bungee jumping. But the girl is competitive and will do pretty much everything, right? So that to me is... I guess it's a surprise. Like I would have thought had I not known Brit that she would have been okay with those sorts of things. Because she seeks out adrenaline. Yeah. She's an adrenaline. In other ways. Yes. But she last night had to go out. She walked out into this little plank. It was like a trap door. And then it's like over the top of a gorge or something. And the trap door. And it was clear too. So you could see through it. Yeah. And then it opens and you plummet down. And at the same time, you had to like recite a number that was in front of yourself. And majority of people who were there doing it, there was five of them were okay with with it. Even if they were scared, they they had processed it pretty well. And Brit was – it was actually so hard to watch. She was in tears. She was visibly uncomfortable with the whole situation. And my question is, why the fuck didn't she just lie and say that she was scared of snakes? Why would you give – like we've done reality TV. We know how this works. Why would you give them the truth? I would lie. Why didn't she say that she's petrified of reptiles and then she would have had to have done the snake challenge or something? I'm Why- terrified of ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it would be so bad if it just fell from the ceiling I all over me. Sleep petrifies me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let me near it. I haven't slept in years. Not because I can't, but because I'm fucking petrified of it. Caffeine makes me psychotic. Yeah. So that Keep would be away. really, really bad TV for you if you were to give me coffee. Yeah, terrible. Terrible. Yeah. See, so I don't understand why people are honest about these things because you know it's going to be used against you. I also don't. And I don't know why <laughs> Brit didn't because she does know better. But <laughs> She absolutely she, knows better. You're right. But she did a really good job. And I think that they very much deliberately put her in the position where she was the one who was going to have to fall through the trapdoor instead of doing the reptiles. But can you imagine how – so like the amount of drama that they managed to get over those few minutes, it might have been like maybe five minutes of Brit on screen where they were like really drawing out the intensity of how scared she was. What it made me think at the time was how long they would have had her standing out on that plank for. Like that would have been filmed over 25 minutes, half an hour, just to try and get as much fear out of her as possible. And that I fucking hate that. Makes me feel even worse for her. And I I felt like a proud mom. You know when you when you're so nervous, okay, no one no one's gonna know this because like we don't have children who are old enough to deal with this, majority of listeners. But I remember like if I was competing in something and my mum would be so nervous that she'd be almost crying for me. And I'd be like, settle down, mum. No, you know, your parents didn't do that? No, they absolutely <laughs> didn't do that. <laughs> they were like, go out there and win. You're not coming home because if you don't my, win. Because my love is conditional, you little shit. 
<laughs> that's a real Your flashback. Your mom used to really, ins- like, she cared that uh, much. That's really kind. No, not for me. For More for my sister <laughs> in gymnastics. But, like, it's, you know, I recognised it in her. No, even when I was doing, when I did Dancing with the Stars, like, Matt had it. He was so nervous for me that he couldn't. He, he just couldn't. He was so nervous. And that's how I felt last night for Brit sitting on the couch. I was like, oh, my God, my child. They're going to throw her off a little platform. I was so worried about her. But she did good, guys. I don't hate them for it. <laughs> <laughs> it made good TV. When I was thinking about the situation, it's the anticipation of that floor falling beneath you that's yeah. worse. It's not the fact that she's at a height. Like, if that were me, I've been bungee jumping. and Oh, we know, Keith. <laughs> oh, we know. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> But there's a ride I went wild. Wait, why do we know? <laughs> because last night we took a trip down memory lane and I thoroughly enjoyed it and I thought it was very relevant to the conversation and I was told to shush and that it was not relevant to the conversation. So why we were all deep in watching Brit and like whilst I was at the peak of my feet, like I was invested, we were sitting there on the couch, Mitch and I, hand in hand, like really absorbed and then Keisha goes, I've been to Africa, I did the bungee jump and the gorge suite, let me show you photos. And we're like, Keisha, not now. And you were like, hold on, I've even got a video recording of me screaming let's put that in here let's let's, let's include the scream of Keisha <laughs> the reason the video is so funny is because I sound like I'm being stabbed <laughs> like it's not it's not a cute girly scream that's true that's a terrified scream and also I was really terrified because from the time that it took for them to wrap towels and a bungee cord around my feet to the point of which I was plummeting off of that bridge was less than 15 seconds, okay? There were no checks. There was not me going, are you sure? They're I know. Like, we do this day in, day out. Off you go. Jump off. <laughs> hurry up. You're holding up <laughs> the schedule. There's 20 people behind you. I can't bungee jump. I did try it when I was in New Zealand and I had a panic attack and Matt ended up taking my bungee jump because um, we paid for two <laughs> and I didn't want to waste the money. <laughs> but this isn't about me. And last night when you were like tro- you were like showing us the family photo album, we were like, Keisha, now is not the time. Now is not the time. There's always that one friend who wants to show you photos from their holiday that they had four years ago. Sorry, when was the last time you were with wild rhinos? Okay. When was the last time you saw a zebra milking its calf? I don't even know if it's called a calf, but I have had those experiences and I thought you'd enjoy it. I did. I did. I do. And I do. No, look, it wasn't the time of the Wait, place. stop. Okay. Can we just play that audio again one more time? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. I'm glad we've all experienced it. Okay, it wasn't the time of the place, all right? <laughs> it was meant to be about Brit. She did a really good job, but all I could think about when she was on that platform is that there's this ride at Wet and Wild up in the Gold Coast. <laughs> <laughs> and you're standing there and there's water rushing down your back and you wear this shell thing. People that have been, they know. I you don't clip know, it on. but this is rogue and I'm but here for it. There's four of you in a row and you're all looking at each other going, why are we doing this? This is an opt-in situation. And then the floor falls from beneath you. And I will say. You get a free enema. It really. <laughs> oh, gross. I've just thought about what would be in that water. Oh, I don't want. I don't want to do that ever again. No, you squ- you just clench shut. <laughs> I say this because I made the mistake at Wet n Wild and I got a free enema there. And, and now I don't go on water slides. Not well, Actually, it wasn't Wet n Wild. It was the one in Bali. But it, it was oh, not good. Worse. It was not good. <laughs> that was the closest thing I have experienced to what Brit went through. And I think she did a really good job because it was really terrifying for me, and I'm not scared of heights, at Wet and Wild. Yeah. And she was over a gorge. I'm interested to see. I mean, obviously we're going to talk about the show. It's not going to be the only thing we talk about, we promise. But last night was a very big night. It was the very first time that Brit entered. And I am excited to see how some of the other contestants go. In particular, someone like Sky Wheatley. Because I know her from social media. I know the version of herself that she presents on social media. I also know that she can be quite polarizing. People either love her or they hate her. And I think that we're very critical of influences and of social media personalities. And last night she came in with a lot of personality and she was very herself I guess and on one instance she also had a moment where she put her hand into the box and she got bitten by a snake and she had to get a star out and that sort of stuff is quite endearing to see people overcome their fears so I wonder how 
this is going to play out for all of the participants and who's going to get their redemption arc, who's going to be seen more humanized on TV, who is it going to really kind of like display their personality in a more authentic way and we're going to dislike it. And I find that a really interesting part of how these reality shows play out. Me too. My favourite moment of last night was actually when Britt got into the camp and she saw Ellie Cole. Our Ellie. Ellie. We love Ellie. She's amazing. She is the most decorated Paralympic athlete I think we've ever had in Australia. So most medals. Of all time. And she was on the podcast with you guys about a year ago. It'd be, have to be about a year ago It was ago in now. January last year, yeah. Mm, I'll actually link that episode in the show notes so that you can go back and listen to it because it was such a good episode. Ellie is a straight shooter. She tells it how it is. I think she's going to make such good TV because she is not the type of person that will sugarcoat her opinions and she's really funny. Well, this is now – so, you know, RIP to maths. I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. Don't think I would ever say that. There has never been a time in history that I have said that and I probably will never say it again. But in the competition of the ratings war between the two juggernauts, this is kind of the perfect time that I'm a celebrity has dropped because I personally have been finding maths very boring and I'm ready for something new. And obviously our girl Brit, we all need to support her. We all need to get behind it. Even if you're not watching it, go and vote for her. The voting opens tonight, which is Monday night. So if you watch Monday night's episode, you can start voting for the participants and we need to make Brittany a winner. She's queen, queen Brittany. Queen, queen Brittany titty. <laughs> Speaking of uh, the day that this comes out, because it will be last night that you can vote for Brit. Well, today's a special day, Laura. Dun, 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 dun. Everyone together. Hip, hip, hooray. Wait, you're not going to sing it from front to back? I don't think anyone from wants to From back to crack? Sing. Do you want me to sing it from back to crack? Yeah, to get the whole studio in Happy here. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. No, I'm joking. I'm not <laughs> don't you hate it? When people are singing happy birthday to you, there's a group of people and you're the one behind the cake and you don't know what the fuck to do with your hands or your eyes and you're like, this is so good. I'm going to be honest. I think I'm an anomaly. I kind of like it. I kind of like having happy birthday being sung to me. I don't like the attention. I just think it's such a novelty that I don't mind it. People who say that they get so embarrassed by having happy birthday. I'm like, get, go touch grass. (laughs) If that is what (laughs) embarrasses you... You need to do a shit on the street or something that's truly embarrassing. Like, I don't know, when everyone at the restaurant joins in and you're like, oh, they're all looking at me. I don't know what to do. It's, for me, it's really I don't know what to do with my hands or my eye contact. Stand there like this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do jazz, jazz hands, hands next time. Anyway, I think that over the course of the years that I have known you, we have really put an emphasis on mine and Brit's birthday because it's on the same day. And so it's a bit of a two-for-one special. And I don't feel as though we've given you enough airtime for your birthdays and so I want to give you airtime for your birthdays Laura I want everyone to message (laughs) (laughs) about your birthday I have ordered you a birthday present I'm really sorry that I wasn't organized enough that it would be here on time for me to give it to you but by the time this goes live you might have it and I think you'll like it and I think you have a pretty good idea as to what it might be I know that it has to do with (laughs) plants because so before we get into the plant thing Birthdays to me are not – and when I say like I don't care about people singing happy birthday to me in a restaurant, it's not because I want people to make a big deal about me. Birthdays for me run so under the radar that I usually don't do anything and I don't care if people forget. It doesn't – it genuinely doesn't bother me and I don't say this out of spite. I know that there's people who like take their birthdays off Facebook and then they hold it against people who forget. You know, So like, passive against you know, but it. it's like some people do it as like, a, oh, let's see who really remembers. Like I don't care. Like if my mum forgot, it honestly wouldn't affect affect me because it's not a day for me and I maybe that's sad but it's not a day that like I think is monumental I don't know I don't know know. we don't need to unpack my (laughs) birthdays are just not a big deal to me and what I mean by that is like I often forget how old I am I sometimes have to type in my date of birth into Google to remember if I'm 38 or 37 which Google told me a half an hour ago, I'm 37 turning 38. When I was 26, I had a whole entire year where I thought I was a different age to what I was. How hard did you party that year? (laughs) (laughs) I thought I was 27 and so I had my 26th birthday twice because I'd already celebrated my 26th birthday and then somebody when I was seemingly turning 27 said to me, you know you're only turning 26 and I was like, wow, that something happened to me. I don't know what it was. I have a few theories. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, theories. yeah, look, Matt and I are going to go out for dinner. But apart from that, nothing 
too exciting is happening. We may do a lunch at our house, but that's going to be in mid-April. And that is because somebody else is organizing it and I don't have to do anything, which is nice. That is the joy That's of, the birthday celebration, yeah, right? That's worth celebrating. But I don't know. I, there's people who are in two camps though, right? There's people who are like, oh, it's sad to not make a big deal about your birthday. Like it's one day of the year where it should be special. And then there are people who don't make a big deal but wish other people would make a big deal for them. And then there's people like me who genuinely don't care and it's not a front. We spoke about this last year on my birthday and I think I realised that I'd kind of like – I'd said that I wasn't at all a birthday person, but as it turns out, it's just because I've been really disappointed on my birthday before. So maybe Mm. I'm half a birthday person, but I actually, I believe you when you say you're not a birthday person, but I want you to know that we love you so much and we're very proud of everything you've achieved by the time you're 38. Is this or 39, who knows? (laughs) Or 28, again, 27, who (laughs) Who fucking knows? Is this like what you thought life would be like as a 38-year-old? I don't know what 38 is supposed to feel like. I don't feel any different now to what I felt seven years ago. I feel tired of, but that's like a result (laughs) of having two children. But I don't know, in terms of like life progression, I'm so happy with where I'm at in life. I'm so grateful for my relationship. I'm so grateful for my children. I'm so grateful for the work that I get to do for my businesses. I never could have thought that my life would be here. And so then sometimes I think when you are so grateful and you feel like you have so much to be happy for, you have to downplay that because you, like I understand it. Yeah, Yeah. and it's such a a privilege. And I know I work incredibly hard for the things that I have, but at the same time, like I got fucking lucky in terms of the relationship situation. I know that because I was so unlucky prior to meeting Matt. But maybe that also is a reason why for me now the years – I'm not defined by a birthday year because it doesn't feel like it has an end to it. I'm so grateful that I have someone in my life who makes me feel special all the time. Oh my God, that sounds so lame. But I do, I really do. And yeah, he's the best. So life is good and I'm very, very happy. And I'm 38 or 37. Who's counting? (laughs) If it was Brit, I'd say I'm 34. (laughs) No one actually knows how old Brit is. (laughs) I actually caught her in an edit a couple of weeks ago where she was like, you know, I'm 35 years old. And I was like, no, you're not, babe. (laughs) You're (laughs) not. I know your age because it's a certain amount more than mine because we're born on the same day. But I also think last year when we did speak about this, someone wrote into us and they had a really good point about this. And they said, I am a birthday person because it is one of the only things that is just about me that we celebrate as an adult. You know, a lot of the other things that we celebrate have to do with relationship success or what would be deemed as success in little quotation marks. And so, yeah, I really hope that we can make you feel special on your 38th birthday. Guys, you make me feel special all the time though. When it comes down to this, like our Life Uncut community, every single day we receive incredible messages from people who say things that they've listened to, that it has helped them, things that they have connected with, reasons why they want to listen to the podcast. Like that is amazing. It's something that most people don't get to experience in their workplace. Having this like constant source. We also get a lot of criticism, don't get me wrong, but like having <laughs> this this constant source of love that comes through from a community that we didn't do anything to create. Like we didn't set out to make you guys kind of all play nice together and say like, here it is. This is our life of community. You guys created yourself off the back of a podcast, which was just two friends sitting down and having a chat. And I feel so fucking grateful that this is my job. I feel so grateful that I get to do Tony May when I'm not doing Life Uncut and I get to run a business with my sister. And I feel so incredibly grateful for my relationship. Like I said, I have these three areas of life, which I don't know how it happened that they're all in a good place at the same time. And sometimes I worry like, okay, well, what's going to be the Tetris piece that's going to make it all fall over? Like that's my biggest concern. That's anxiety. (laughs) But That's for you. <laughs> but genuinely right now, I'm very, very, very fucking grateful. Yes, it's my birthday and I'm very, very happy and I'm very grateful for you guys. And thank you. You don't have to go out of your way to make me feel special today because you make me feel special every day. I am also very grateful for everyone in the Facebook community for their good recommendations of gifts to get Laura because Laura, you are the hardest person to buy a gift for. I know it's, because because my love language is so deep. I, I'm zero on the gift scale. And maybe that's why also birthdays don't, rate as a priority to me because I don't care for gifts. Don't need anything. I actually struggle so much to get you a gift because you're not materialistic. But I do want the propagation station. (laughs) Usually (laughs) not being materialistic is a good thing, but it's really bloody hard when it comes to presents. But you also don't like massages and stuff that could be like an easy just gift. So I like food and sleep. (laughs) 
I was really and plants. hopeful on Friday when I posted in the Facebook group that you had, I'd seen you that day and you were busy at Tony May and I thought you had shit on for the whole day. So I thought I was safe. I also didn't know how to block a post from someone being able to see it. I don't think you can block a post from the person who owns the Facebook page. <laughs> I don't think you can. Maybe I could have just blocked you for the day and then you couldn't have seen it. But I did ask for some help about gifts in the Facebook group and you guys came through. Oh yeah, you were good. I asked for the other green thumbed goddesses to give me their plant recommendations because I am not a green thumbed goddess. Say that three times quickly. Green thumb goddess. Anyway. Only a green thumb goddess could say it <laughs> fast. We do. <laughs> we do have a gift coming for you. I'm really sorry I wasn't organized in time for it to get here. I, but it is plant related and I think you're gonna love it. Okay. And I run it by Matt so it doesn't cause a divorce. So I will say this. I did see this post. For anyone who doesn't know what the fuck we're talking about, Keisha basically she put a post up and it was a call out for you guys to give your present IDs for me in the Facebook group. Of course I was plant gonna related. see it. <laughs> plant related. And I really, really enjoyed the enthusiasm. But what I would like you all to know about me is that my obsession for houseplants runs so deep at the moment. It is so out of control that I would say I own 99.9% .9 of the things that were suggested in that thread. And that's when it dawned on me that I have a real problem. I was like, I just want to come downstairs on my birthday and I want Matt to have like fucking like laid out garden soil in the lounge room and just started a veggie patch with some all spectrum lights in my lounge room. That's what I want. I want your, my entire table to be sprouting. Your kinks are weird. <laughs> I want him to fuck me on the table covered in sprouts. <laughs> Sorry, how do we end up here again? I don't know. Can I just say that there was one brand that kept on being brought up. I already own it. I feel so <laughs> stupid because I've now realised that it's We The Wild. Yeah. But for some reason when I saw that written out as the website, I thought it was Wet He Wild. <laughs> what? <laughs> like Wet and Wild? Wet He Wild. <laughs> I didn't I was like, is it because of helium, like the atomic element? Why is it called wet he wild? Wet he wild. And I kept on saying it to myself and it wasn't until like literally two hours had passed that I checked back in on the suggestions and someone had written we the wild and I was like, oh, wow, I wet, don't belong wild. in this. Community. I don't belong here. This is not my place. These are not my people. You're like, it does sound fun though. Shut wet up. he wild. <laughs> Sign me up, baby. <laughs> Slap it on. <laughs> We wanted to talk about the thing that everybody is talking about this weekend. Well, it's the news that hit the headlines on Saturday and it made so many of us ask the question, should we feel bad? Kate Middleton, Princess Catherine, she came out with a public statement on Saturday, which would have been their Friday in the UK, saying that she had cancer and speaking about her cancer diagnosis and the fact that she was undergoing preventative chemotherapy. Now, as you guys all know, because we spoke about it on the episode prior, Kate had been missing from public affairs for the majority of this year. And there had been a statement that had been released from the royal family saying that Kate would not be present for royal duties until Easter due to a planned surgery that was happening on her stomach. Now, that did not stop the rumour mill from running absolutely fucking rife and there were so many conspiracy theories. The conspiracy theories had gotten out of control, namely because of the Photoshop fail that we all saw happen last week where on Mother's Day in the UK, Kate posted a photo or a photo was posted, um, obviously she didn't post it, of her and the kids and it was then later said by Getty that it was an AI generated image, it wasn't real and then all hell broke loose. Now, some of the conspiracy theories that were surrounding this and that really got out of control were things that maybe William was having an affair. The rumoured affair from 2019 was brought back to the surface and that maybe that affair had kicked off again. There were rumours around her health. There was rumours that maybe she had died and they were delaying the announcement of her death because of King Charles being currently undergoing cancer treatment as well. There were rumours of surgery. There was rumours of eating disorders and bulimia and that she was having time for stomach surgery because of her bulimia. Have I missed anything here? There were a lot of rumours. There were so many. We couldn't list them all possibly. There were so, so many. For anybody who saw her video statement, it was very humanising to see Princess Kate sit there and speak candidly and say that she's undergoing cancer treatment. And I think for anybody who watched that, 
it was such an interesting way that she set it up because it, the whole setup was thanking people for their kindness and their grace. But anyone who's been across the news cycle for the last couple of weeks knows that there has been zero kindness, zero grace. It has been unrelenting, the memes and the mockery of what it is that she, all the reasons why the fact that she's been missing. I think the really big question here is, is how much privacy should be awarded to a family that not only lives off the public dollar, but also whose primary role is public facing. Like that's the big question is how much, how much should we be sorry for the fact that there was speculation and the conspiracy theories that followed around Kate's disappearance when so much of what the royal family gains is because they are public facing? I think there are two parts to this. I have not made it a secret that I'm not a fan of the royal family. And I think it's important to acknowledge bias when we have these conversations. And this scenario has made me more solid in that opinion. And I know that there are people who are really going to disagree with me and I'm okay with that. And I'm also okay that you have different opinions. There are two questions here. And one is, do you think that they are entitled to complete privacy? And the other is, should we feel guilty about the fact that we added to the speculation yeah. or, you know, bought into the conspiracy theories or had fun with it, that we enjoyed the gossip of it? The first on the privacy element, for anyone who lives in the public space, I think there's this, there's this balancing act of the fact that you are paid by the people and therefore you should have transparency with them. But there is an element of, well, everyone deserves to be able to keep things private if it's something that's very sensitive and if it's something that they are working through at the time. Mm. I think for a normal person undergoing something like a cancer diagnosis, I've actually had this happen in my family and I'm not going to give too many details, but someone in my immediate family took three months to tell us that they had received a cancer diagnosis. And at the time, that was a really shocking thing for us to hear. It put a lot of questions about why didn't you tell us what was going on and those things did end up being answered. And I don't necessarily agree with the answers, but I had to respect the fact that that's what they wanted to do. And a cancer diagnosis is such an individual thing, even though it affects so many people, how everyone processes that information is going to be really specific to the person. And so I normally think that people undergoing something like that are entitled to privacy. But when it becomes a royal member of, you know, this institution that is the monarchy, I question whether they traded that in to receive the role that they have. The main part of their job, I would argue, is being public facing. That's kind of what they do now. They don't have as much to do with, you know, ruling Great Britain as what they used to. So their main job is to kind of bring awareness to certain causes that need them and attend public events and bring eyes to things that need eyes on them. And I don't think that they are entitled to the same level of privacy as what other people are. I think that they made that deal with the devil, in I my opinion. I guess the question though is, is not that they're not entitled to the same level of privacy. They don't. They don't receive anywhere near the same level of privacy that a normal person would receive. That's not even a comparable thing. But are they entitled to any privacy, especially when it is around something that is so sensitive like a cancer diagnosis? My belief is yes. I think everybody is entitled, no matter how much you've traded with the devil, we are all entitled to some sense of privacy or some sense around timelines of when you are able to talk about the things that's going on in your life. And I guess the question around Kate Middleton is we're expecting not only that she would give us transparency, but that she would be at a state of mind to be able to process what's happening to herself, to be able to also have those conversations with her children and then navigate the public space. I think the place where there's like a lack of empathy and a lack of sympathy for that is that the royal family has the most supposedly incredible PR team around them, the most incredible advisors that help to navigate these very, very sensitive situations so that when you, and when I say when you, when Kate Middleton is in a situation where she is experiencing something that is beyond maybe her comprehension or her ability to be able to reconcile how she feels about it, they're supposed to help guide her within a public space and protect her. And I think we can all agree that that system doesn't work and that that system did not serve to protect her in that instance. You know, the Photoshop fail, the lack of conversation, the going underground, all of those things only create groundswell. And because of social media now and the way in which things can become viral and the way in which conspiracy theories can spread like absolute wildfire, I think that that's where the real problem stems from. It's almost like not understanding or not realizing the impact it was going to have. Or maybe they did realize the impact that it was going to have, but they didn't 
care enough to stop Kate Middleton from being like the sacrificial lamb in that situation. But I guess ultimately for me, when I watched that announcement, I felt sad for her. I felt genuinely sad that there is a real woman at the bottom of all of this, the questioning as to whether we are entitled to or not entitled to, the conspiracy theories. To me, it felt incredibly sad that there is a real person who has to sit there and explain what's going on in their body and face up to a camera in order to be believed. And even in doing that, they still were people who were like, this looks like AI to me. You know, this has the AI fuzz with some of the comments below the actual video, the announcement video. But for all the conversations we have around body autonomy, around, you know, having the right to one's own sense of self, that is undermined in the case when it's someone of such a huge celebrity presence, i.e. Kate Middleton. And when we talk about this idea, Keish, what you said, the trading of your privacy for all the benefits of being public facing, there is that question of, okay, well, where is the line? And now I'm not saying that media should be deeply sorry because I, I think it's very important to draw a line between what it was that they're poking fun at. The media was not poking fun at Kate Middleton having cancer. They would never do that. They were poking fun at the disappearance and the absolute absurdity of the way in which it was being handled. And that's why it got out of control. So I think that, you know, the way that it's now flipped in media landscape where everyone's like, we should feel ashamed of ourselves. How dare we jump on the bandwagon of memes? It's almost like that's the product that's created by the disappearance. That's the product that was being fueled by the lack of conversation and all of this little, the little seedings of nuggets of information and lack of transparency. I should also make it clear that I feel as though I may have sounded like a bit of a dick when I said that Kate (laughs) didn't deserve privacy. I do think that she deserves privacy. I'm talking more about the institution of the royal family as a whole. And it's very interesting to me that King Charles is currently going through cancer treatment himself. But we're not talking about that. We're all talking about where the fuck is Kate. It makes me raise my eyebrows even more Mm. that I'm like not saying that because they were willing to say that one person had cancer, they weren't willing to say that the other person had cancer. That's not what I'm insinuating. The phrasing of abdominal surgery, what part of the – Abdom- like planned abdom- abdominal surgery yes. is very different to so the way in which it was communicated in January planned abdominal surgery versus major abdominal surgery there's doesn't sound like there's a lot of difference but the inference of that is a lot of difference it left people wild to make up their own imagination around what was happening Kate is worthy of privacy but in order for you to obtain that privacy from the public you have to give them enough clarification so that adults in the room can go okay there's something going on and right now she needs the space to process that Mm. and I don't think that we awarded her that but I don't think it's our fault and that's why I don't think that we should feel guilty because the institution that is the monarchy have worked so hand in hand with the media for generations they have traded stories they have the tick of approval of what goes out about them which pictures are actually posted and that has existed for so long but what has changed is that we now critique that I almost feel as though there's a bit of gaslighting going on here with them saying that you should feel bad about doing this because we've been conditioned to assume that what they're telling us may not necessarily be the truth. But the next thing that I've been thinking about is the amount of people that are coming out saying, I feel really bad about the fact I kind of joked about this and I bought into the conspiracies and I had a bit of fun with it. You know, I toyed around with what might actually be going on. Blake Lively even came out and posted something on an Instagram story where she was like, I feel like an idiot and I'm really sorry. You know, and there have been many celebrities and many normal people that have also kind of said, I feel a bit bad for participating. It's this like crisis of conscience that's happened. Like everyone's now in panic stations being like, are we bad people? Mm. Because we subscribe to this conspiracy theory, which so many of us did, right? And and we did. We spoke about it on Tuesday's episode. You know, we had a laugh about it. We had a laugh about the absurdity of the Photoshop fail, as most people did. And in most friendship groups, people were talking about, well, what do you think has happened? There is something incredibly humbling that happens when the truth is as simple as 
I am very, very sick and I need my privacy. And when you hear that being spoken by a woman that is being completely humanised, the royalness was stripped bare. Even the way in which it was filmed, it was very understated. It was a, and I don't want to use the word frail because she's not frail, but she's a very slight in frame. Just a woman sitting there speaking to camera with nobody else around her. Her husband's not there. It was very much just her and the people saying, this is what I'm going through. And I guess that that is why now there's been this massive backflip because it was a plea for humanity almost is how it came across. And I question whether, you know, Kate's gotten to the point where she has made this video. Was that because she felt that the collective public harassment was so huge that it was the only way that she could kind of get everyone to fuck off by saying, guys, I'm actually going through cancer, leave me alone and give me some space. Was it because of the public harassment or was it actually because of the multitude of failures by the PR team that work for the Royals? And I think that had the royal family not put us in a position so many times in the past where they'd breadcrumbed us with information and we were left to put the rest of the pieces together ourselves, had that not have occurred so many times, I don't think that people would have run as rampant with these conspiracies. You know, I just feel as though the people who are feeling guilty for this are feeling that way because they're like, oh my gosh, we've pushed her into a corner where she has felt the need to disclose something that she thought was private and that she didn't want to tell us. She didn't want to tell us that she was going through cancer. That's obvious. Otherwise she would have told us that. And they're feeling guilty because they feel as though they contributed to forcing her into that corner. And I personally don't think it's the public harassment that did that. I think it's the failure of the team that are supposed to protect her in the royal family so many times over. It's not one thing. It's the collection of these things that I think pushed her into this corner. And I think they are more responsible. They also threw her to the wolves. The fact that she yeah. came out and had to make this stupid pithy statement around like, oh, I also enjoy Photoshop. And sometimes I fiddle around with photos too, just like the rest of you. Like that to me felt very much like the machine of the monarchy throwing her to the wolves and using her as the scapegoat for the reason as to why that photo was posted. Whereas that could have been an opportunity for anybody else to be like, look, Kate, is not wanting to be public facing at them. And I know we can talk about this until the cows come home around the way it could have been handled and the lack of transparency. I think ultimately it's not how badly it was handled, but it's how badly she was the one who was left out to dry during a cancer diagnosis, during a chemotherapy treatment. There was no support. There was no protection of her. It was just one instance after another that she became the sacrificial lamb in that whole situation. On one hand, the machine serves them so well. And, and it is a needed product, which is a huge revenue raiser. It is imperative to them that we have a keen interest in the monarchy. It is what keeps that wheel constantly in motion. And I guess the dark side of that is you don't get to choose when you hop off the bus, even if you should. Even if you should be able to say, I am entitled to privacy now, which you are. Unfortunately, the wheels of that bus don't stop moving just because now it is the time to claim privacy. And on a very, very, very small scale, this happened with Brit when she was going through the breakup with Jordan. Now, I am not drawing comparisons between Kate Middleton and Brittany Hockley. Please let that be known before someone jumps in our reviews and goes, oh my God, I can't believe. But what I'm saying is you guys might remember Brit was going through a breakup with Jordan. And at the time, the media was ferociously reporting around their breakup and at the time, they weren't yet broken up. They were in the phases of a complicated situation of her not knowing what was going on, of her hoping that they were going to be able to resurrect the relationship. And there were some gossip magazines and podcasts who were very much reporting that their relationship was over. And then when she finally came out and said that we'd broken up, it was like a aha, we got you moment. And the thing that was so hard I, to... I actually feel further than that. I feel like people literally then reported, see, I told you months ago. Yeah. Like, like we had the scoop. Yes. And the problem with that is, is like, and we spoke about it, you know, Brit feels very passionately around the fact that it doesn't matter what scale of celebrity you are, there are always things in life where you're entitled to privacy until the point that you're ready to share that part of your story. Because just like when great things happen, i.e., 
when I was pregnant with Marley. I didn't tell everyone that I was pregnant the day that I pissed on that fucking pregnancy test. You know, I didn't, but it's true though, right? Like we choose the moments to share the happy stuff and we also should be able to choose the moments to share the bad stuff. And the argument during that whole situation was people saying, well, we're invested in your relationship, so we have a right to know. And I think the bigger part here is the faux concern. And that's the same thing for for Princess Kate. It's this faux concern about her well-being. Where is she? What have you done with her? We care about her. The reality is we don't really care about these people, not deeply, not on a sense that we feel like we are friends with them. We're concerned with the gossip. We're concerned with like the the water cooler chat around their lives, but at the bottom of it, they're real people. And I do I do question how difficult it must be even though you've subscribed to it, even though you're bought in and even though you had a choice to join that royal family, how hard it must be as a mother and as an individual in times of great family distress and trauma to navigate the public side of it and to be able to satiate the unsatiable needs of the public audience whilst also protecting your three children who didn't choose. They just grew up in it. All right, well, it is time for Accidentally Unfiltered. Guys, your embarrassing stories, they're my favourite bit. Please send them in. You need to send them in. If you have a humiliating story, that thing, that thing that happened to you that you have been saying you're never going to speak about, you just want it to go and stick your head in the sand and just die, tell us and we'll share it. And we can all laugh about it because when you claim and reclaim that thing that makes you embarrassed, you can no longer be embarrassed by it. Okay. This one reads, I got a whoop band a few weeks ago. In What's an, a whoop band? It's that fitness band that measures everything. It measures your sleep. It measures your... Uh, like a Garmin? It's kind of more than that. It, there's a word, strain. Strain it measures. And it tells you like what percentage you need to recover. It's What's a strain? Like what strain you've put on your body. This <laughs> shit, it frightens me. I do not want to know. Why would I want to know how close I am to death? Because data can be good for some people. No. Tracking it can be good. That to me sounds anxiety riddling. I like really that. want one. <laughs> <laughs> Matt has Matt has a Garmin and when, when he's asleep, every so often the light will just turn on because something will have happened. And then I get blinded by the light in the middle of the night and he's just fucking happily sleeping, getting his REMs. Well, and there I am getting like blasted. This one doesn't have a screen. So at least you'd be more approving of a whoop. How do you, uh, what do you do? You go online and check it. Yeah, yeah, I think it's like to your phone, to the app. Anyway, it is important to the story. I got a whoop band a few weeks ago and in an effort to encourage each other, my whole workplace decided to add each other on the app. I've only worked at this company for a few months and I'm close with some people but not so close with others. Our whoop data has become a real topic of chat in the office, something that we are all bonding over. Fast forward to last Saturday night when I'd been to the gym in the morning and I'd gone out for some drinks with some friends in the evening. I ended up hooking up with a hot guy that night and we were going at it for hours and hours. We barely had any sleep. Fast forward to Monday morning when the whole group of us were in the office and we were catching up about our weekends when my CFO turns to me and said, interesting time to be doing yoga for 86 minutes. I'd forgotten that my whoop band had been on my wrist and it just assumes the type of activity that you're doing based off of previous data. (laughs) Now my entire office knows that particular session had me at 60 to 70% of my max heart rate. Oh, she could have put in more effort then, couldn't she? (laughs) 86 minutes. Why does she have it linked for everyone to see? I don't understand. Because you can do that with Apple and Garmin. Like you share it. It's meant to encourage because people are competitive. Why do people care how much sleep you're getting? It's a competition. <laughs> Mate. Of who's getting the most recovery. We're all fighting it out for who's the most ultimate human. I hate this. I hate this. <laughs> That's because you wouldn't do well at it. No. I, <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you it would not be clocking up 86 minutes of yoga for me. No, it was it a good be- seven-minute <laughs> yoga session you had. That was, they'll look at mine and it'll just look like I'm in sleep, just laying there in missionary. They're like, Laura slept. <laughs> That had a slightly elevated heart rate she for must seven have been minutes. Having a good dream. All right, okay, guys. If you have an excellent unfilled story, send them on into the DMs at Life Uncut Podcast. And it is time for suck and sweet. Keisha pops. What is your suck. suck? My suck is so incredibly niche, and I haven't actually checked whether it's okay I share this story. But the other day, I was scrolling through Instagram, and my boyfriend was sitting next to me. And at one point, he kind of like really concerningly went, why are you looking at that? And I was like, what? 
And he's like, why are you looking at that? And it was just a shop, like a sponsored ad on Instagram and it was for like a brand of clothing or something. And I was like, why? What do you mean? Like, huh? <laughs> and he goes, show me. And I showed him and he was like, oh. And he kind of acted a little bit weird. And after a while I was like, why are you so concerned about what I'm looking at on Instagram? It was a sponsored ad. Like, it's so strange. Turns out the model in it was his ex-girlfriend. <laughs> and now... Now, because I engaged with that fucking Oh <laughs> my <laughs> fucking God. How have we gotten to this part of the Dude, episode and you're sh- only telling me this? She's so hot. Do you remember it when hurts. I No wait, <laughs> wait. Do you remember ah. when I told you about how I bought the invisible zinc? Invisible zinc. And I brought it home. <laughs> and Matt was like, what? Like same thing, like kind of what? And the fucking chick on it, the girl, the model, he dated before me. <laughs> so, like some like super famous model. And I would just bought it because I was like, oh, I was just trying to keep sun safe. You were just trying to protect yourself from the damaging effects of the sun. And now your relationship is damaged. I'm now being reminded as well because yeah. the product's there in my bathroom. And there's her beautiful face, her beautiful non-sun damaged face that I want to look like because I bought the product. And Matt's like, I used to have sex with her. And I was like, fucking hell. I bet she looked good. She looked <laughs> great. I bet she looked good while you were having sex with that. Well, now it seems as though this girl, and I'm so sorry if she listened to the podcast. How like, embarrassing for you. You're a fucking beautiful human being, and which I hate, obviously, naturally. Good for you. But you Bad did sell the me. clothes. Bad for me. She pops up all the time now on my sponsored ads. <gasps> I've actually screenshot six of them. Six separate. Do you send Facebook them? Do you send them to um, Toblerone or do you just screenshot them for your own sort of like, you know, I torture? Them, I sent them to Brit. <laughs> You can send them to me now. (laughs) All right. And what is your sweet for the week? My sweet for the week is very wholesome. Speaking of my boyfriend, this is really insular this week. He's a really good cook. And often that kind of pisses me off because he's a better cook than I am. But every now and then I get to enjoy the fruits of the labor. And the other night he made dinner for his friends and I. And on my job, we made a tiramisu from scratch. And my job was to whip the cream. I don't have a, what's the cooking appliance that you need to like? Pot. No, you know, a kitchen master or something. Who, the, who something has Something that whips cream. I had to do it by hand. I did it with my arm and now think my about how our are gran- I Think about how our grandparents used to survive. I don't need to think about it. I did do it. <laughs> Keisha's out there washing her clothes on a stone <laughs> by the river. <laughs> so he made this beautiful dinner, but I contributed to a really, really delicious tiramisu And I'm enjoying the things at the moment that are like I'm really trying to seek joy out of the process of things. And I felt so fucking accomplished that I did not use one electronic appliance other than the – oh, no, wait, we'd use the fridge. What, did you heat it it with just a campfire out the back? (laughs) (laughs) Tiramisu, you just like set in the fridge. Right, got you. So you used a fridge. Yeah, I used a fridge. But other than that, all elbow grease. You just set it in front of the air conditioner. (laughs) Oh, that's also an appliance. No. I don't have an air conditioner with Uh, that. But anyway, I had a really, really beautiful dinner and – And it was kind of just that reminder that, you know, sometimes doing things the old school way, it can make you feel, can make you feel the little dopamine surge that I've been seeking. There's nothing better than like when you put something together or you do something on your own and you're like, I'm capable. Like I can make a bunk bed. I felt so accomplished. I'm proud of you. All I did was whipped cream. (laughs) I'm proud of you. All right. My suck for the week. I'm not going to get into a rant because I have ranted about it so many times to Keisha. Oh no, this is, this is worthwhile of a rant. No. He's a dick. It's not. I hate him. I hate him. I hate him. Okay, so I got a fine on the weekend, guys, and I'm not proud of it, but I got a fine. I had Buster off leash about, we were like four houses down from my house. I live on a hill and Buster being nine years old and having three legs, he struggles these days, especially when it's hot, man. He's, he is not the young sprightly boy that he used to be. So we were coming up our hill heading towards our house and I'd taken him off leash and a fucking ranger. He like pulls up his car, he gets out and he goes, I know you. And he was just, you know what? The whole interaction was shit. It was just a terrible, terrible interaction. And part of me was like, I know the rules and this is not me seeking any sort of like special treatment. But I'm like, man, we're four houses from our house and he is an old dog with three legs who cannot get up the hill. Like fucking have some empathy for the poor thing. Sorry. <laughs> Come Disabled on. dogs do deserve special treatment. It's like he's disabled. Like let's. He's doing his best. I, okay? I'm just trying to provide the good quality of life for the poor guy. Okay. But also I kind of was like, 
wow, like I'm okay with parking fines. I get it. I'm okay with dogs off I'm lead. I get it. Fines. No, I get it. Everybody has to do a job. And this is not me shitting on rangers who 99.9% of the time do an exceptional job and their services are very, very required to keep things, you know, what's the word? Just co- is order. it cordial? <laughs> Cordially. I don't know. I just disagree with you. Whatever. <laughs> But this incident I thought was so unreasonable. It was so unreasonable and it was so following rules for the sake of following rules and not actually looking at the greater picture and going, is this an unrestrained dog who's going to attack? No, fuck. He's like a very slow elderly dog who's got three legs, who's walking beside two babies in a pram. Like, chill out. Anyway, that was my situation. Is it relatable? No. Is somebody going to be like, bro, you did the wrong thing and you deserve a fine? Absolutely. Was it a fucking suck for my week? Yes. So that is my suck. My sweep for the week, however, is that yesterday we had such a good day with the girls. There was like all these sweet activations down at Bondi Beach. We took the kids. They got to do like plaster funhouse shit for free. It was just a free, it was a free activation. They went and destroyed some sandcastles that were on the beach and they had the most amazing time. And every so often when you have nothing on your plate and you are able to just like clock in with your kids and they go and do really just – sweet things that you can tell really fills their cup. I was like, oh, I'm loving this. And I had a really nice time. And then it ended with Matt going and watching Idol and us sitting on the couch watching Brit on TV. And it was a fucking good Sunday. Raging about the dog ranger. I did rage. I've raged a bit. But anyway, I told you you should send an email. I did send an email. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, guys, that is it from us. Go and watch Brit on I'm a Celebrity. Please vote. It is going to be like, honestly, it is up to us to keep her in the competition. And if she ends up being crowned queen of the jungle, it's because we did it. We made it happen. I mean, actually though, because you've taken over her Instagram account, which is a lot of trust to put in a friend. I don't know how I'd feel about giving someone the logins (gasps) to my social media. Oh no, we'll talk about that on Thursday. (laughs) I've found some stuff. (laughs) (laughs) You know the drill, tell your mom, tell your dad, tell your dog, tell your friends and share the love because we love love. 